So uh, Sophocles was a very famous writer. He had some several theater like Oedipus or uh, Antigone, for instance. Uh, first, I would like to mention about Oedipus, then I will continue with Antigone. So it's a tragedy. Uh, the city of Thebes was an ancient city-state in Greece. And the king of Thebes, father of Oedipus, learns that his son is going to kill him, as the oracle said. Because of that, the father of Oedipus left his son in the forest so he would die by himself. But Oedipus was lucky and some shepherd found him and take him away to another city-state. And the king of that city raised him as their own. So Oedipus become prince of another city-state in Greece. Uh, long story short, he comes back to the city of Thebes, kills the king of Thebes. He was his father, but he didn't know that it was his father. And he married with the queen of the city of Thebes, which is his own mother, but he didn't know that she was his mother. So they even had children. Uh, because of that, the city was cursed, actually. So Oedipus was trying to fi find out why the city was cursed, why the gods was angry for the uh, people of the city. What was the problem? He was trying to solve the problem. And he finds out that he was married with his own mother. And after he learned that, he gouged his eyes and become blind. And he left the city, exiled himself. His daughter, Antigone, helps him on his way out because he was blind and he didn't solve his way. So this is the end of play Oedipus. Okay, so Oedipus tragedy and seer. But after we have another tragedy, another story about Antigone. Oedipus dies in exile. And after his death, Antigone turned back Thebes. When she comes back to her city, she finds out that her brothers, Polynices and Eteocles, were fighting against one another. So there was a civil war between those two brothers, those two princes, those sons of Oedipus. They were fighting with one another and both of them died during this civil war. And at the end of everything, their uncle, Creon, becomes the king of Thebes. When Creon becomes the king of the city, he buries Eteocles as a hero because he was on the side of Eteocles. But he also forbid that Polynices to be buried. Polynices' burial is forbidden and Eteocles had a state ceremony for his burial. During this time, Antigone comes back to the city and sees all that two of her brothers have been killed each other during the civil war and their uncle Creon become the king of the city. Why would Creon forbid anyone to bury Polynices? He didn't want Polynices to be buried because he's punishing him. You would say, yeah, but he's dead already. How can you punish a dead person? Because according to the religion of those ancient Greeks, if you don't have a proper burial ceremony, if you don't have a proper funeral, your soul cannot go to afterlife peacefully. So you can't go to heaven. So that means if Polynices is not buried, that means he is damned forever. So he can't go to heaven. And because of all of that, Antigone is sorry for her brother. Antigone buries her brother secretly. Now we have a trial between Creon and Antigone. The king of the city, Thebes, he is the lawmaker and he is the judge. We don't have balance of power here. Creon is judging Antigone in here. The reason we are talking about this tragedy, Antigone tragedy, is because of this trial, because of this judgment. Creon says that as a king, he ordered that no one should bury Polynices. So as a king, whatever he says is law. The citizens of Thebes supposed to follow these orders. But Antigone, as burying her own brother, she broke the law according to King Creon. There are two sides of story. Creon is on the side of positive law. That as the lawgiver, he made a law, so you're supposed to follow that law. But Antigone is on the side of natural law. She claims in here that kings, parliaments, or anyone cannot strip our fundamental rights. Burying my own brother, making a proper funeral ceremony, 
is my God-given right. It's my natural right. No city, no government, no king can take this right from me. So Antigone is on the side of naturalistic perspective and the crayon is on the side of positivistic perspective. So that's why actually we are talking about this case. That's why we are talking about this trial, the case between Creon and Antigone. Antigone is claiming that she is rightful. She has the right to bury her own brother. She has the right to make a proper funeral ceremony. It's her God-given right. It's her natural right. It's her fundamental right. And Creon claims that as the legislative power, he made a law that every citizen should follow. But Antigone is claiming that the legislative power cannot strip of our fundamental rights. Remember, I was talking about Radbruch's formula. Many Nazi Germans have been tried and most of them defended themselves by the positivistic perspective. Yes, they did those things, but they were following orders or they were following the laws. Yes, we did that, but at that time it was legal. Yes, we did that because we had orders to do. So Gustav Radbruch is claiming in here that if a law is unbearably unjust, that means that law is not law after all. This is unbearably unjust and it is unacceptable. So you can't claim this as a law. You can't claim it as legal because the main purpose of law, the one and only purpose of law is justice. So if you, if you don't have justice in here, that means it is not law after all. So that's why we were talking about Antigone trial, the case between Creon and Antigone, or that's why we are talking about Radbruch's formula. So this is the essence of law. It is very important.